I'm going to hand over to Prof. Skida to talk to us about There's a student behind the data. Over to you, Prof. And before Prof starts, um, because Prof is going to give us just a keynote, it's not a keynote address, um, but he's just going to give us a little bit of information and thought provoking thought as well as Mr. Popas has also did the same. Um, with Prof uh, Skitter, because we have enough time, he will allow questions and answers at the end of the session. So I welcome you to use the chat forum or also at the end when he is done presenting, you can raise your hand to ask your questions or comment either on the introductions done previously or co comment on the um, on Prof Skitter's talk for this morning. On that note, Prof, over to you. We are at your... Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to be involved in this uh, meeting today. It is an uh, amazing experience for me to be exposed to learner athletic, analytics in general, but to colleagues that we could sit around the table today and from all over the world and, and, and have some deliberations, share some views. I'm going to share my uh, slides. So just in a moment, please bear with me that I could get my slide set going. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. For the uh, uh, interesting introduction that we've had today, I think it is very important what he said, and you really succeeded in setting the scene for this this two day uh, webinar and seminar, or what I would like to call it, colloquial discussion. When I was asked to get involved in delivering some notes to you today. I thought that, that of the work that we do at UWC, my involvement in it and the unit I am in, and it is against the background of my uh, training. I'm a trained sociologist and have been involved in uh, academia and in educational research for many years also. But therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it is not strange that you would hear from me that there is a student behind the data. So my presentation is based on the information accumulated during the process that I was employed by UWC or st are still employed in the MapWorks uh, project uh, while I was involved and the Making Your Mark uh, project now program to assist students in and in, 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 in the, in the university in developing a, a, a predictive analytical tool for studiousness. And we've got a lot of lessons that we learned from that. And that I want to share with you. I'm, I, I want to talk to you today about what is this thing called a student? I'm gonna take you through a journey, how we went back to basics, exactly like Mr. Pogba said, how we went back to basics and the, and the views that, that sort of were, were exposed when we started to share it. Ladies and gentlemen, just a few introductory notes for you. My slides would be fairly complete simply because it is the notion in, in, in uh, virtual meetings that I don't literally sit in front of you. I, don't look at me, you have my slides to look at. Therefore, uh, the slides would be more complete than, than usual. Let me start with some introductory observations. The idea is that it could be included in our colloquial discussions as we progress through these two days. And it will be sometimes provocative statements I would make. 
simply because we went back to the drawing board. Not reinventing the wheel, trying to discover how the wheel was invented. It seems that all tertiary education institutions, and that is basically all over the world, uh, do some data analytics uh, simply for, or mainly for marketing, to, to enhance their teaching and learning capacity and ability and, and, and to pick up the areas where there are problems, but ultimately, to enhance the throughput rate of their students. These three outputs, all of them depend on the input of learner analytics. It plays a crucial role in understanding what we are doing. And very important to take note is that there is no one best practice. You cannot go from one university to the other in this part of the world to the other part of the world and say, yes, we have a best practice. No, there, there's only room for improved practices. And I think we must, must take note of this statement that this is why we are here. This is why we are here to raise the bar of our respective institutions where we are involved in, to take from what other people say, to tailor make it for our institutions. There is no one single best practice. And also one to want to make note of from some of my observations is the UWC is doing phenomenal work. Uh, this, we are, I do believe from, from my experience, at the cutting edge of this, of this uh, phenomenon of, uh, of learner analytic data, collecting learner, having access to learner academic data and so forth. The C Super Malala Network Partnership and, uh, and the faculties, all of them, play into this and it is amazing work that we do. You will hear from my colleagues that we share what we do, take from it what you can, and we want to take from yours what you do in your institutions and take from that what is applicable to our, to our environment. So ladies and gentlemen, all researchers and scientists, as researchers and scientists, we are, we are acutely aware of the fact that the more we know, the more we become aware of what we don't know. This is why we are here today in this room. When we go back to basics, we are talking about this thing called a student. What is this thing called a student in a university environment? Worldwide, all university campuses show both commonalities and unique differences. And the challenge for us is to dissect both of these concepts and make it applicable to our environments. Commonalities are usually academically related. It is often, not necessarily, non-negotiable academic criteria. That is the curriculum. That is the standard that we set across the world for academia to have qualifications that could be respected and accepted and recognized across institutions. The differences, what we talk about of all educational campuses, is usually student related, mainly related to unique environmental, where they are situated, which part of the world they are situated, physical, the physical availability of, 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 of facilities, buildings, etc., and the cultural 
and psychosocial factors that could have a positive or a negative impact on our knowledge transfer. In combination, these factors, these four factors, make a university campus, make a tertiary, tertiary educational institution. And in all three of these, there's a human behind it. In all three of these factors, you will see this history. History reflected in buildings. And the UWC is not unique in this sense in South Africa. All campuses, campuses in South Africa are reflections of the history of South Africa, good and bad, positive and negative. And we will have to take from that what is good and what is positive to take us forward into the future. After all, all of these unique elements would have an impact on our throughput rate. But what is this thing called a student? You know, a student get access to any university once he's got a senior certificate with a certain level of performance at school. Nice to hear. And nice to say that uh, it's not so easy that when I apply for a university access in another country, I would have to, it's not necessarily recognized. I would probably have to uh, pass an exam to get access to make sure that I'm on standard. In South Africa, this is the case. At UWC, we offer approximately 2,010 modules, I was informed. Educational subject modules is offered to students. The reality is, the students that enter the gates of our university have had exposure to a maximum of a probably five to seven subjects, or you want to add modules, that they re relate to their school education of probably one or two or even none might have had a bearing on their first year subjects. When I study psychology at the university in South Africa, I haven't had that subject at school at all. If I study social work, I haven't had that subject at all. So what is the reality? The reality is that students that enter the gates of our universities all over the world were not prepared by the secondary educational environment for university training, for tertiary training. They were prepared for the job market. They were prepared to be solid citizens and to earn a living. That is the primary purpose. It happens to be so that we add some qualification to say, yes, if you have this uh, extra performance, I have, I have this extra performance at school, we will allow you into tertiary education. But theoretically, all students that managed to have access to tertiary education according to the rules and regulations in a country, basically start afresh. That is the reality. They all start from the same page. This thing called the student that we have on our campus comes from a spectrum of backgrounds. It's a spectrum of cultural, family, and educational contexts that enter our gates. In South Africa, there's no standardized element other than, I mentioned, school academic performance and financial resources that access a filter to get access to university. In some universities abroad, in the first world countries, sometimes, you will find that the financial resources uh, would be covered by the government or by the state. In South Africa, 
you have to access financial resources, whether it's NSFS or personal funding or whatever it may be. So ladies and gentlemen, these two factors are actually the only uh, providers built into our access to universities. Not even your criminal record will deter you from entering our gates at university. It is clear from this that students need a mirror to fathom our personal preparedness. Because of this diverse backgrounds that we, that we come from, diverse histories that we, that we come from, and diverse historical institutions, gates that we enter. So it seems to us here in the group that I was doing our research with is that uh, is a Center for Student Support Services in the unit for uh, uh, the Office for Academic Support. Uh, it seems that first year students in particular, sometimes it carries over to the second year and third year, that they don't know what they don't know. And this is a very important element in our, in this new, unique, edu, and I would like to call it edu-social environment. It's an it's a academic, psychosocial blend that they enter in the world they're going to live in for some time. The reality check on throughput rate. It is such an important element and is the cause of hours of debate, of creating definitions, what it is. But in the end, ladies and gentlemen, throughput rate in South Africa is directly related to the funding formula. If you have a poor throughput rate, your funding from the government is less. It seems to me that we focus our, to enhance our throughput rate, the focus is usually mainly on first year students to prepare them. We have programs and projects to get first year students on the page to prepare them to say, this is what you are and so forth. But the point is, throughput rate is often not caused by first year students' inability to pass. It carries through to the second and third year students also. It's a delayed graduation. If I, if I miss one subject, a core subject that would delay my graduation in my second or third or final year, I'm in trouble. I'm a throughput rate, negative impetus, negative element in our statistics. So clearly, ladies and gentlemen, learner analytics is key to identify areas for intervention where this preparedness, or may I call it re-socialization of students for this university environment can be improved. We have to press the right buttons if we want to be successful. Just some comments for our colloquial discussions during these two, year, uh, two days of, of, of sharing views. Interesting that the dominant forms of assessment at universities would always be tests, assignments, exams. That is what we in academia use. If you have enough marks, your marks is high enough, you pass. If not, you fail. And that's it. But it does not provide this holistic picture of all the factors that contribute to the successful student and that contribute to those students the, 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 that were not successful. Uh, what, what made the contributions to those students that were not successful? We need to know more. What do I say? We need to sharpen the tools, ladies and gentlemen. 
we as learner analysts have to sharpen our tools to read the student better. The majority of the students, probably 80%, according to some information you will see just now, just struggle to get through the year and pass. They don't seek for attention, special attention, special assistance, special help. They just pass. They cruise through university. Me, a case in point. I just struggled to pass. I struggled to manage my time. I struggled to do enough just to pass and where I failed, I just had to recap and say, whoa, I have to go back. And that's it. What does it say? The majority of the students are the neglected missing middle. The majority of, the stu of our students are probably underperforming. Yes, throughput rate would be determined also by a focus on the strugglers, the students that don't cope, the students have problems. We have to pay attention to that. Paying attention only to that sector is not going to make a difference, a serious difference in the throughput rate. And this is because all our campuses show different physical and cultural and historical environment as mentioned. And some of these elements could have a direct or indirect student academic performance impact on it. And we have to sharpen the tools to look into this, to this amorph cauldron of information that we have access to so that we could make sense of it. It seems to be that we have a broad consensus amongst psychologists, educationists, of, of what a student really needs to be, to do, to be academically uh, successful. The Center for Student Services staff and, and the actions were there. It became clear, and, and it's obvious, not for us only, it's true for Murray K, it's true for Oslo, it's true for all over the world, that some struggles students' experience could have been avoided if they had the early warning signs of where they are heading towards. Because we don't know what we don't know. So with the CSSS group at the UWC, we, we embarked on a paradigm shift. I'm so privileged to be associated with that. And that paradigm shift sort of moved from a deficit interventionist approach to a more proactive, possibility-focused approach. And that, include, that includes the student's voice in partnership with the university administration. And this is two important elements that give some meaning to our, to our uh, data, uh, learner data, learner analytics data. So what is it that I experienced? First of all, knowing too much and having too detailed information from our learner analytics is just as unmanageable as knowing the too scant little information or little information and that is that is something that that is important to take note of we could go into detail and give a, 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 mammoth, a lot of information but if we cannot interpret it it's only data we have to turn data into information so yes, knowing too much or knowing too little, neither has any practical value for our purposes 
in servicing our academic environment and the student's success. So yes, in search of this balance is, is the challenge that we undertook at UWC and that we would like to share with you people during these two days. It's that journey that took us back to the drawing board. And this is important to take note because that journey took us back to the figures. We've had access to figures. But it seems that even a person like Albert Einstein had had something to say to us. Not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. During our journey back to basics, there was an individual, actually unknown individual to me, but a photo I discovered that have had a profound impact on our thinking. During the advent of the COVID times, there was this picture of this individual somewhere in the middle of Africa. And I thought, Africa's got news for the world. This man deserves our respect. To put on a mask during the early days of the COVID, this was the solution. And you could see, it's 100% organic. It's 100% protecting safe. It's 100% fit. We've had research done on what the fit should be that you don't uh, uh, don't uh, that you could see through glasses when you put the mask on, etc. Et it's 100% recyclable. But you hear what it is? It is blended postmodern technology in the real sense of the word. I'm proud to be associated with this individual and going back to basics. So allow me to share some observations and also to give you some pointers, possible pointers during my research in the Making Your Mark program at UWC. We, this, we dissected 28 international predictive analytical instruments to sort of that can be used as a soundboard, a reflection, as a mirror to students so that they could fathom where we are. Am I on track? And have I adapted to this new academic environment, university environment? But what was clear when I discovered, when I dissected these 28 instruments, the students of voice was absent. You could see it clearly here. It is typical top-down, academically inclined, designed instruments. 35% of the clusters in all of these 28 instruments focus on creative thinking, creative mind, those things that is theoretically associated with tertiary academic environment. It's about self-motivation and social integration, and then it tapers down to some other stuff. We took from this what we could, but clearly the bulk of these instruments showed to me the voice of the student is missing. So what we did during that time was that when we embarked on this research to to test one of these instruments, we added three questions to the evaluation of it. And these three questions was, if you look at successful students in your faculty, what do you think is the one most important ability there? That is looking at the people around you, my fellow peer students. The second question is, okay, Having said this, having seen this, what is it that you need? And then, what do you think your faculty should do? 
These are the results we found. Students saw, recognized what they success, the successful students, they recognized successful students in as being hardworking. They know how to manage their time. They have perseverance. They are determined to complete. They are motivated, which is probably the same thing, both of them could be in the same category. Hardworking and time management could probably also be in the same category. Self-discipline, hardworking, same thing. You see all these personal traits. And then there pops up speaking, communication, ability, and discussions, having to share with views. But we also ask the students, what is it that I need? Now I've said this. I see this. These are, this is the makeup of a successful fellow student. What I need, I need better time management. I need more commitment, hard working, less procrastination, more focus. That's probably time management, self-discipline and so forth. We also asked what the faculty should do for us. The faculty should give us writing skills, speaking and communication skills. The faculty should help us with study methods, learning skills, and so forth. And you could see what this critical thinking thing is further down of what was from, came from the international environment. I'm rushing for time. The standard protocol, ladies and gentlemen, of intervention addresses three levels. And there's the primary, uh, the whole class, in the secondary, more group work, and then you have the individual work. It seems to be that about 80% of the students are dressed in the, in the overall, that's the international figure, uh, in, in, in the group work environment. You know, the, the big group work environment. But then we have uh, students that are at risk and then we have the individuals. But at UWC, we were able to dissect it further. And, I have two or three slides left. I was talking about the missing middle. We were able in our evaluations when we designed an institution alert index. It seems to be that from transfer, that is from uh, 2018, 2019, and the second, uh, the third uh, trans, uh, transition that we did our research on, 8.3%. That means about three out of every 10 students have had, sorry, had no problem. And one out of every 10 students would have a problem in this study. The missing middle is probably here. But if you look at this, what happened here is whilst this group became bigger over time and because of interventions, this group became smaller, but this group also became small. So who are the neglected people? We have to work on different elements, ladies and gentlemen. We have to work in improving the ability of the poor student, but we also have to nurture the good student to excellence. And our data should cover the spectrum. And our information with putting the student behind it should cover the spectrum. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I can inform both, uh, in, we need information that can inform both the faculty, the institution, and the whole movement of current status and trends in the student's experience. Let us all use this collegial opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, of these two days to share our knowledge, to improve our practices, not in search of a best practice. We will never get there. To improve our practices, 
so that we could serve the student population and we could serve the institutions that have all unique traits. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Wow, Prof. Every time I'm in the room with you, I, I learn new things. The more we know, the more we come to a realization that we don't know. Thank you for a thought provoking presentation. And you do have a question uh, because I'm looking at the time as well in the chat. Um, I'm going to get it right this time because she used her name, Lerato. So Lerato has posted a a comment and also, not a comment, but actually a um, some questions, some couple of questions. I'm not sure if you are able to see the chat. He, uh, she says, hi, Prof, very thought provoking talk. Please elaborate for me on the following. How do you profile your students to know where uh, to know who they are? That's number one. Number two. How do you handle changing profile over the years? And the last one, how do you deal with the minority groups to make sure that their experience is still memorable in a positive way? Uh, thank you for that. I, I'm very hesitant to say to a student, how do you know who you are? You are who you are. And we should not take that away from anybody. I am who I am. I operate in a different environment. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, the university campus environment is according to all criteria of society, an abnormal society. It's an abnormal environment. I can prove it to you. The average IQ of the person that enters the gates of the university is higher than the average IQ of the population. The average facility for education is higher than that or any in the population, in the communities. The average training of the presenters of your lecturers is higher than that you've ever experienced. And we have facilities for recreation. Everything is there. It's a different environment. But what is also different, you have nobody that wakes you up in the morning to say you must go to school. And this is where you have to adapt. This is where we have to say, I have to change my tech. I have to change my way I operate in this environment. There's a saying in, in sociology, we talk about, you have to switch containers. You enter the gates of a university campus, you have to switch containers. And we have to give students that ability. Stay who you are, but be versatile. Be able to switch containers. I don't think I should go into a little too much detail because of the time. You muted, uh, Elizabeth. Um, there are a couple of comments in the chat. Uh, one is saying very informative and practical. This is from Magdalene. And the other one comes from Melikaya. I'm not going to say whether it's he or she, but they wrote, my thesis is on the gamey or gamification of higher education content. Do you have any thought on gamification as a tactic for increased engagement? I do have. It is a total new environment. You are treading new, new ground. And, and, and the spin-offs of that, we still don't know. You must remember, ladies and gentlemen, 
we have to, when we, we, when we raise children, uh, we often give children guns to play, police and robbers, uh, police and, and robbers and, and so forth and so forth. I also played with guns in my life. I have never had the urge to shoot anybody. So it is so important to take note of how far the implications would be. And we've done some research on television just to trigger your thinking a little bit more uh, on, 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 on uh, television movies. What, what is the dangerous part of movies? And it seems to be that the dangerous part is the effect of my actions not my actions. We are inundated with movies that shoot people. But when you see the effect of that, it becomes disastrous. So gaming, it's amazing how, how vicious these games nowadays is. How vicious the content is of games people play and so forth. But it seems to be, it does not necessarily rub off. We need a lot of more information on that. It could be a logic link. Whether it's proven by data, I don't know. But gaming in general, uh, I'm not talking about, uh, I have a, a sense of what you are referring to. It, Education is not only a game. It's creating a mindset of knowledge, something different. You can use gaming as an instrument, I suppose. Go for it. We need more information. Thank you, Prof. Um, Melika, if you have more questions or you need more clarity, you can raise your hand and I will recognize you so you can speak to Prof directly as well. Kofi, you also posted in the chat, Can you can unmute and ask Prof the same question that you posted on the chat. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Elizabeth, and thank you very much, uh, Prof Scott, uh, for a wonderful presentation. <clears throat> My name is Kofi uh, Marumula and I'm from uh, UNISA. Uh, Prof, I wanted to just ask you a young question with regards to the comments that you made around uh, best practice. And uh, certainly as somebody who has been um, uh, practicing uh, in, in information system, business intelligence and analytics uh, for, the, for the bigger part of my, my humble career, those comments really resonate. And uh, I remember the days when we used to have a very inferior infrastructure. And um, it was often funny when we are sitting for this international exams because the manner in which they asked these questions and how we would respond, we would respond in the context of how we would have to do it in South Africa with the limitations that we have. And what was always shared as best practice then was really um, not, not best practice for us. And even in some cases was not feasible. So I, I do support the views and the ideas that um, there is no best practice. However, Prof, my question is that in the context of what you have shared with us, um, and we are talking about learning analytics in general, there is always a scenario where others are doing uh, better than others. And there's often a learning process, which may include um, a, a, a benchmark or an alignment uh, of some sort where we learn from others. Um, is it really a, a bad idea to, to work towards a, a certain position where that position can, can, can be defined as a, as a kind of, um, when I say minimum requirement, uh, I mean not, not, not exactly, but there's a sort of a benchmark of some sort to say, in the context of um, trying to understand what this thing uh, of a student is and how 
how do we assist them? These are the, you know, the list of, of, of measures or indicators, and, and this is what they mean. And um, if you are able to kind of work out this sort of measures, then these are the kind of insights that you can, that you can get. Um, I just wanted to check, Prof, as to what are your views regarding that, especially mapping it back to the comment that you made around best practice. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It is the case that we have been working on an instrument that could assist with that. We call it the student thermometer. It's now in the final phases of our testing. We did manage, I do believe, the group we work in an excellent group in C++. Uh, and, and this group managed to drill down back to basics. You see that guy with the mask? We went back to real basic. What makes, the question is, what makes a successful student? We drilled it down to six criteria, clusters of information, uh, which is what I would like to believe is inter-institutional. Inter uh, there are, for instance, uh, just to give you one, and with that I will conclude. Uh, we talk about communication skills. You have to, to have reading, writing, listening, and, uh, and speaking. If you cannot do that, those four, you have a problem. I don't say to what level, but what I do say, if you don't have the ability to speak in class with colleagues, with students, fellow students, with lecturers, to come across and project your views, you've got a problem. And then we have to adjust that. If you cannot write properly what you think on paper, you're not going to pass. Our previous question was from a doctoral student. If you cannot put your thoughts on paper, they're not going to pass you. So these are provisors, the very bare basics. We drill down to that. Yes, we are in the process of putting on the table uh, early learner, uh, early, uh, what's it, uh, alert for students' studiousness, early warning instrument for students' studiousness. And I think... Uh, we will probably be able to share some good information during our next uh, deliberations of coming up of the uh, SAIR of the, our, our conferences. But yes, I think we are there. I have uh, six of them, uh, but it's not, I didn't decide not to share that with you at this point. It's still in the final developing phase. Thank you, Prof. Um, uh, apologies, I, my phone decided to go on. Are there any final, final questions? Anyone who have this burning question that they want to ask, but they were not sure whether to ask it. Now is your chance to ask that question. Um, uh, Chuma, the floor is yours. Uh, Prof, you only have two minutes to respond to Chuma. Chuma, you only have one minute or two minutes to ask your question. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Elizabeth. I'm not sure if I'm audible enough uh, you for are. everyone to, to hear. Yes, okay, yes. okay, thanks, Prof. Uh, my name is Chuma Mbaleki from Moltasa Sulu University. Uh, mine, is, mine is a quick one, Prof. You mentioned uh, something very much uh, interesting about access to higher education uh, institutions and uh, student profile and background. Uh, unfortunately, you correctly specified that the only determinant that guarantees one access is academic performance from high school. There is nothing else that is being determined. I, I'm, 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 I want to check from your understanding or from your wisdom, do you think we need to get to a point where we enrich those determinants with a student profile? For example, we look to where the students are coming from and the environment from where they were learning. We use that particular information and 
get to an understanding that it is justified that the amounts will not be likely uh will not be similar to those coming from at least backgrounds that are better off to do at what stage do we use that particular information to enrich our determinants uh of of giving them access to higher education i'm not sure if that was uh yes yes thank you i have some thought-provoking ideas for you and i'll do it in short the problem at the current problem is that the average mark of a tertiary education of a, of a secondary education school mark gives me access to university that means if I am a language guru, gifted person in languages, and I fail my maths, I won't get access to university. The same is for the contrary. If I am a gifted mathematician, and I fail my language, I don't get access to university. So what do the universities do? We get the average person and above average person. I think we should think of in future, giving access to university courses, study directions. What on earth do you want? If you, I want to become a, a language expert, uh, an author, a, what do I want to do with maths? I don't need it. I'm not going to attend any maths classes. If I want to become a, 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 a uh, I'm just thinking aloud now, become a nurse and so forth, then, then you need some maths. I don't need languages. If I want to become an engineer, I don't need languages. Now, not to that extent, at least. I, I know what I say, we could debate it. But I think we should move in the direction of course related access so that we could get the gifted person in that direction and not only the average student, and we have to show the door for that gifted person. Just think about that for future. Uh, that means you won't be able to switch courses. I give you access to the language department and that's it. You can't switch from there to law. Right, you get my idea. I think that is probably where we should go. And I think it will address a lot of our, may I call it low key performers at universities. We already cut out the excellent guy before he entered university or the gifted person. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, um, Stanford. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, uh, but you are more than welcome to put your comment on the chat and Prof will gladly also probably respond to all the comments that are posted on the chat. Um, <clears throat> we are almost heading towards, uh, let me see if we do have, enough of time because we go into have a break and then we move into the into the workshops um, <clears throat> immediately so I want to allow more time so that you can go and refill your coffees um, I need this okay so let's get to the announcements and the the house rules going into the workshops so, I would like to firstly actually also um, 